So the first thing we'll do to start out is swim in a paragraph of scripture to set the tone. This is 2 Timothy 2, verses 22 to 26. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. I love this passage. I think of a man on, the, on a horse, uh, or maybe some young ladies on a horse. I just overheard some people have horses in, uh, here. And not wanting to fall off the left side or the right side. And the left side here would be being caustic, rude, aggressive, belligerent, um, sharp, uh, ugly. Falling off on the right side would mean being a coward, being quiet, being um, or making excuses for not sharing the truth, not correcting, uh, shrinking back, uh, calling something the same when it's different. <laughs> you know, just, just shrinking back from sharing the truth, correcting. And what I love about this is Paul understands the tension here. And he would have us not <clears throat> swim in the, uh, the youthful passion of pugnacious interaction. Uh, he, he, this is not about uh, losing our temper or becoming flustered and exasperated. He wants us to, it's interesting, flee youthful passions. I, I have in mind here, um, Lord have mercy, I have in mind a few young men that I've seen over the years who've traveled with mission teams to Utah, and we've asked them, how did your time at Temple Square go? And this has only happened a few times, so, I mean, I've, there's been hundreds of believers, but a few times I've heard young men say, I, it was great, I totally owned them. <laughs> and it's like, well, that's not the, maybe there's a place for that in some context, but, you know, in conversational evangelism, I think this is the wrong spirit. Um, uh, but it's interesting here, he wants us to flee those youthful passions and he wants us to unite with other believers in the way we do this. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Had nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. So he doesn't want us to be quarrelsome. And it's really tempting in the 21st century to think, aha, so I shouldn't quarrel, therefore I should not debate. I should not correct. I should not go back and forth. There's no reproof. There's no exhortation. We should just share our perspective. <laughs> this is just an ecumenical interfaith dialogue where we can just learn more about each other, right? Right? No, no. Um, no. We're not to be quarrelsome, but we are dot, dot, dot. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach. So we're teaching. There's stuff they don't know, and we do know, and it's not arrogant. It's an act of kindness to teach. We're imparting something that's uh, essential, so crucial to know. Teach. We must be able to teach patiently enduring evil. Now, aha! Paul knows that if you don't fall off the right side of the horse, if you stay up on that horse and you're teaching, you're going to get pushback. And Paul is preparing believers for the pressure put on you. You need to shut up. Be quiet. Don't cause trouble. Just go quiet. You don't want any, right? That's the temptation. I just, I'm not going to say anything anymore. No, Paul says, keep teaching and endure the evil. Swallow the awkwardness. Endure the tension. It's worth it because you love people and you love the truth. Keep teaching. And he goes on to say, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Wow. Correction and gentleness for Paul are not mutually exclusive. They can be done in the same moment. We can be corrective and kind. That, that, that is, for Americans, 
at, uh, for many Americans, that's emotionally incomprehensible. <laughs> to, to, be, to correct someone is to be unkind. Uh, so what sort of theology for Paul motivates him to trust the Lord as he's teaching and correcting, avoiding quarrelsomeness, yet enduring evil and pursuing Christian virtue and especially kindness? What sort of theology motivates Paul? 25. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. We're talking with people who don't merely need a re-education. They cannot be socially engineered into the kingdom. You can't uh, do a better job with cookies and neighborly you know, sweetness and not do the trick. This, this, is, this is a spiritual uh, reality with a miracle needed. God may perhaps grant them repentance. They need to repent. They need to repent. And they need the gift of repentance. And God perhaps would give it to them. And this repentance comes with a knowledge of the truth. And there's a spiritual enslavement, a dominion, a regime, a power over the people we're speaking to. He says, they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So, will you just drop your jaw with me at how rich this paragraph is? Wow! There's spiritual warfare. There's a need for correction and teaching. There's a call to Christian unity. There's a call to reject your youthful passions and, and, and pursue the fruits of the Spirit as you engage your... He calls them opponents. Now, those, those words don't have to be scary. We have enemies, we have opponents that we love, that we pray for, that we serve, that we reach, that we draw in, that we want to befriend. Okay, I hope that sets the, the tone for what we're doing. Let's talk now about some different... Whoops. Trying to be all fancy. Okay, we're going to talk now about two different kinds of evangelism. Um, there is a temptation in the modern evangelical church to reduce evangelism down to what you might call friendship or relational evangelism. And I think the best way I can help you all think about this is just to have different categories for evangelism or outreach, uh, relational and stranger evangelism. Relational evangelism has a different mode or strategy or tone. It's slow communication with the long view. It's with people you'll, li you'll likely see again. Hey, can we talk about this next time we meet? That would be a great conversation topic for the next time we, we hang out. We're not in a rush. We don't have wretched urgency. We have gospel urgency. You never know when someone's going to die. We, we can't count on tomorrow. But there, there is a kind of gospel patience. God is sovereign. We're not God. Uh, we don't have to be wretched in our urgency. We can be patient. There's also a place for direct, short-term, stranger evangelism. People that you've never met before. People that you might not ever see again. So I think the, the, the challenge for us Christians is to have a healthy love for both of these. Street evangelism is, of course, the, the latter. And uh, relational evangelism with your circles of friendships and uh, connections are going to be the other. Okay, let's talk about another um, category, active and passive. Um, I remember going down to Temple Square on the street it was a great opportunity. I think it ended in 2019, but it went on for decades. And it started out with some Christians realizing that there were thousands of Latter-day Saints meeting on this uh, property with, next to a public domain uh, road that was closed off. And you know, I mean, you'd have three, four, five, six, seven, perhaps more thousands of, of Mormons uh, meeting and getting a good spot to watch this, uh, you call it a pageant, it's almost like a musical or a play. And they would, uh, set aside a place on the, on the grass, and then they would loiter for hours uh, to, the, to the booth for, for food and uh, all these 
young adult groups and youth groups would come and uh, they'd have matching t-shirts even. Um, and they're just like there in, in, in droves. And the Christians, I like to say, Christian evangelists are like mosquitoes. We get really excited about large groups of people. <laughs> and, and Christians are like, oh, this is a great opportunity to have gospel conversations. And so the first Christians that showed up on the street were just, were just overwhelmed with just dozens of, I mean, they were just crowded out and surrounded by Latter-day Saints that wanted to talk with them. And what, what happened is over the years, more and more Christians came and started organizing efforts to train and pray and sing and meet and go out and do small group conversations. And it was awesome. Why am I sharing this? Well, sometimes we'd have these young adult groups come to do evangelism, and they'd show up, and they'd just sit there. Now, to be clear, just showing up gets you 80% of the way there often. Uh, I know it's an act of faith just to show up. But sometimes I'd have to be like, you guys got to like stop loitering around and just go for it. Work. Evangelism is work. Evangelism is a, a work. Uh, if you show up, don't waste your time. Get the tracks in your hands and start working toward initiating conversations. And sometimes there's a bit of pushback. Well, I'm just going to wait for God to provide the opportunity. And I, and I wonder if we might just think clearly about this. Um, we wait for God to act while we work for opportunities. That's, there's no contradiction there. We wait for God to act while we work for opportunities. Uh, God is blessed by both of those modes, and they're simultaneous. So I, I want to be creative in initiating these conversations, but I also want to be uh, attuned to providence. Like you kind of watch the hand of providence, see where God is providing opportunities. And sometimes, especially with uh, relationships where you have to wait, you can't say anything because of the way a strained relationship works. Or Sometimes you really do you have, to, have to just wait. But Okay. Uh, we're going to get to the actual questions here in just a little bit, but um, we're going to finish out this preparatory segment with six disciplines in evangelism. I even worked in an LDS acronym there. I see that? I snuck that in there. Um, when uh, believers join the effort to do evangelism, I, I think of six different disciplines that we can grow into. The first is listening. Um, a good evangelist um, with a normal person. There's different personalities when this just doesn't work out. But when you're talking with a just a typical unbeliever, it's good to create a lot of space for your interlocutor, your dialogue partner, to, for them to talk open-ended, for them to feel safe, to not have to uh, be quick. Uh, you guys ever heard that um, verse here, James 1.19? Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. It's a good parenting verse. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So it's good to ask questions. I mean, if you, if you have the truth, if you have the word of God, you don't need to... The, the, the power of your evangelism isn't in the number of words you're sharing. So, I mean, you can share a few things that are very powerful and then just sit and listen. Right? There's a discipline there. And if you're a chronic monologuer like me, you have to work really hard to listen and slow down. One of the best tips I could give y'all in Utah for uh, evangelism is just slowing down. Just slow down. Declaring. Um, there is a place in evangelism to share the truth in a way that does not uh, present itself as perspectival. Does that make sense? Like what we have to share isn't our mere opinion. It's not our mere vantage point or perspective. We declare something. The word of God is not to be <clears throat> treated like it's a cross-cultural data point. We, we, have, we have a message from a king. And so there's, there's a place in our evangelism where we stop acting like we're the dialogue partner sharing an opinion and we appeal to God's testimony, God's so-called opinion, God's word. Does it make sense? Like there's a place in evangelism to point at the Bible and say, this is what God says. And the whole world is working against you. You must be arrogant for doing that. You must be mean. 
you must be uh, uh, foolish. But no, let's just embrace the so-called foolishness and appeal to the word of God and assert it. This is what God says. We can be kind in doing that, but we need not limit ourselves to this mode of opinionated dialogue. Yet, there is a place for asking, have you considered? This is sort of the non-declarative mode where, you, where you, you offer something up for consideration. There is a place in evangelism for, look at this with me. Uh, this is what has helped me. <laughs> May I share it with you? There's a kind mode in sharing what God says as something to consider. There, there's a place for that. So I, I hope you see the declarative and can I say sherative <laughs> uh, component to this? There, there, there's, a, there's an oscillation. There's a going back and forth. There's, there's a kindness to doing this. There's a boldness in declaring and there's a kindness in sharing. Correcting. We have a place in evangelism to correct our opponents with gentleness. Uh, you know, there's a whole uh, sort of YouTube scene out there where you know, they, they, they try to show, they try to exemplify kindness, but they kind of cheat. They cheat because they never correct. Um, they never declare. They only share, they only listen, they only encourage, they only question, but they never declare and they never correct. Um, I like to call this uh, multidisciplinary evangelism hard mode. <clears throat> have you guys ever played a game <clears throat> where you have easy mode, normal mode, and hard mode? This is hard mode evangelism, where it's, where... <clears throat> we, we, we want to ask and listen and share and encourage, but at times we need to declare and correct. And that's when it's hardest, because that's when you're going to get most accusations for not being kind or not being patient. Um, and it's also hard because it requires a more self-control. Uh, it requires more maturity. But this is a pattern in Scripture we see. <clears throat> Encouraging. You see even Jesus saying things like, you are not far from the kingdom of God. There are people out there that God is working in, and it's our role to fan the flame. Wow, yes, that's a great idea. Don't lose that idea. That, what you're thinking, what you're reading, what you're feeling right now, what you're pursuing, that's good stuff. And we want to encourage people who seem to be on the right path. People who are perhaps taking issue with what their own Latter-day what their own Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles teach, we want to fan the flame of of, of biblical truth in our dialogue partners who um, who are maybe seeing things correctly. Uh, we don't want to be so hypercritical and jumpy that we can't we don't give them space to be encouraged in in positive movement. And then lastly, questions. Um, evangelism is. Uh, a, a lot of questions. It's learning to ask great questions. You say Socratic or rhetorical or leading. That, that's not bad. Um, to ask questions to guide the conversation along, to help you maintain or sustain the, the conversation. Um, that's honestly what you're going to get mostly from me this morning is, is questions that I ask to get the conversation started. Um, and I hope these questions are something you can take today and use. They're not, they're not for uh, expert evangelists. They're for... I like to say evangelism is less like seminary and more like Sunday school because the people we're talking to typically are not smarty pants apologists. I get to talk to some of those uh, downtown Provo because we, we have apologists coming out like every Thursday right now. Um, the Provo City Center Temple uh, corner, the, the, the sidewalk around there, has become a kind of speaker's corner <laughs> and the apologists are showing up every week. This is just not normal. That's not normal evangelism. I've been doing this for two decades. That's very rare. <laughs> So, but most of what we're doing is with simple people who don't know the basics, and this isn't to flex, this is to, to share the gospel. So we want to ask questions. It's, it's a very humane way of being personal and helping people think with you.